This morning, uh, I'm going to be moving a little bit on in what we talked about. Uh, so last, last week, I was talking about holiness, and we were talking about, we looked at First Peter, um, and where he talks about being holy as he is holy, and, and living at that standard of holiness, and living up to that, and, and setting that bar really high. And I wanted to continue a little bit on with that. Um, so, so he says to be holy as I am holy. That's actually not Peter saying that. That's actually God saying that. God says, be holy as I am holy. Uh, it's, it's, it's written it several times throughout the Bible where God says to his people, us, be holy as I am holy. And, and a lot of times we look at that sort of thing and we, we, we've, we've come to sort of bring our standards down to our life experience. And instead of putting a bar up there that says, I absolutely can be and I will be, we say, well, I don't think I can do that. I don't know. That seems like a pretty tough thing to, to, to put that high. But the goal that we have should be that we would never fall. How many think that is a, a good goal? How many would like to say, I will never fall? Yeah? A few people? Yeah? Yeah? I think, I think that that is a good goal, that that really should be our goal in life, that, that we should have this high standard, this high goal of never falling. And, that, and, and so we're going to look at that this morning, this goal of, of never falling and we're going to look at, at how to do that because, uh, and, and what that will look like in our life. Um, so we're going to look this week at Second Peter. So you can turn in your Bibles, if you brought one, to Second Peter. And we're looking at Second Peter chapter 1. And I love Peter... You know, I, I, we, I, thinking about Peter, you know, we've kind of shared a few things that, you know, Jenny and I sort of joke about things uh, with, with Peter because Peter is, you know, he's this guy who, he was a fisherman and Jesus called him and he was very brash and he was very zealous and he was kind of unthinking at times. He was very much, uh, his actions preceded his thoughts a lot of times, right? And so, you know, if you read the, through the stories, I mean, there's the stories that, that with that came great faith, but, uh, but with that also came a lot of other stuff. You know we, know, we know Peter is the guy who denied Jesus three times, and then, and then you know, he said, I'll never do it, I'll never do it, and then he just right away went and did it. We know him as the guy who, you know, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter's up there, and everybody's there, and Peter's running around saying, hey, let's build houses for God and Moses, and we'll just all stay here, and we'll just do this, you know, this is awesome, you know, and, and, and the Bible even says he didn't even know what he was saying. <laughs> you know, he was saying stuff without thinking about it. And, and this is kind of Peter. Um, but then we come later on and we see, uh, we see Peter. And I mean, even at times, if you look through Paul's epistles, you know, Paul and Peter, uh, they, they got into it at times. Ooh, my mic. Paul and Peter got into it at times, you know, because, uh, you know, Peter was like not consistent always. You know, if he was with if he was eating with some, some Gentiles, he'd be eating there, and the Jews would come in, and Peter would run away and go hide in the corner with the other people and stop eating with the Jews, pretend, oh, I wasn't with them, you know, so that he wouldn't offend anyone, but, you know, and then, and so him and Paul kind of got into it over that issue. You can read about that in the New Testament there. Uh, <laughs> but then Peter, later on, he writes these stories, uh, not stories, but he writes these epistles, and he, and he comes out with this such amazing stuff. And you can see just the growth and maturity in Peter's life from the time that Jesus called him, even to the time that he... And you just see this amazing maturity that he came to. And so in Second Peter 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant, and Simon, just so you know, his name originally was actually Simon. You know, when Jesus came, called him Simon. And this is the cool thing about when we talk about prophecy and we talk about these gifts, you know, and about calling out the gold. Simon means broken reed, but Peter actually means rock, you know. And so Jesus said to him, no, you're not just a broken reed, Simon. You're not just this little guy who doesn't think about stuff, but he says, you're a rock. And Jesus called him 
even in that place of immaturity, to a place of maturity and said, you've got great things in store for you and you are actually strong and you are actually this. And so it's, it's a great thing to see even Simon Peter. So he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins." Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's just pray quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. I thank you, uh, just as your word says, that, that every word in here is the inspired word of God, that it's, it's good for teaching and, repre- re- and reproof and correction and for building up your people. So, Heavenly Father, I, I just ask for every person here today that our, that our eyes will be open, our ears would be open, and our heart would be open to see, to hear, and to understand that, God, you would transform us in your, in, your, in your presence this morning. We ask you just, Holy Spirit, to come and bring revelation to us this morning. Bring revelation to our hearts. Bring revelation to us and transform us this morning. So, heaven, so, so Peter's talking about here, and we're talking about this goal of never falling. You see, Peter starts off here, and he says that, that through the righteousness of God uh, and of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have received a, a, a faith. Uh, so he's writing to them, and he says that they've received a faith as precious as, as disciples. So Peter is writing uh, to these people, and, and he's saying that, that what you have is the same as what we have. Through Jesus' righteousness, you have been given the same faith that we have. And then he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so when we're talking about that bar, I talked a little about this last week, but when we're talking about that goal of never falling, that goal of living up to this righteous standard, living to this place where God has called us, he's saying to us, you have grace and peace. And that, that is a prophetic outpouring on us of God's grace, of God's peace, that everything we have, we, we, everything we need, we have already. It's already been given to us. The grace enables us to live to that. I talked about that last week, the grace enabling us to live to that place of holiness. And... Uh, and, and so when we go into that place, whew, I might end up using that thing. We'll see. Put a little more room there. Okay. So that grace and peace that we have, it's there to, to enable us to do what he's called to do. So let's look at what he says here. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So um, if, you, if you were at House of His Presence a few uh, earlier this week, uh, Joseph was speaking about the promises that God has given. Uh, and, and Pastor Dale, you know, he's been uh, pushing forward into this, this area of, of the outpouring of the Spirit. We've been going through Acts. We've been looking at all this stuff. Um, and we've been looking for and, and just waiting on God and for, the, for the outpouring, for, for new and fresh outpourings of His Spirit on our lives. And, and, and Joseph was talking about this, and he said that uh, he, he talked about how they were waiting for the Father's promise. You know, they were waiting for the promised outpouring of the Spirit in the upper room there. 
And, and he used the analogy of, of Christmas. You know, if you promise your kid uh, a, a Christmas gift, uh, they don't have to beg you for that Christmas gift. They just know that, you're gonna, that on Christmas Day, they're going to open that thing up, you know. Or, or, and, I mean, that could go into anything, a birthday present, anything. You look like that. Uh, when, a, when a parent promises something to their children, they're generally not lying to be, like, on Christmas morning, like, ha, fooled ya, enjoy your Christmas, you know. That's not what parents are doing, right? I mean, if you do that as a parent, you're probably, you, you might need some counseling. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if, if a father or a mother, if a parent promises something, a kid can know that that is a promise that they can trust, right? And they don't have to beg their parents, oh, can I have it, can I have it? Like, you don't, you know, like, on Christmas morning, like, here, come bow down and beg at my feet so that yeah, I'll give you this gift that I promised you. But they just know that it's going to come to them in the, in the, in the right timing, so when we look at this thing of the promise, it says that he has given us these promises. He has promised the power, and that's that, that whole outpouring. That, that wasn't just promised to those first century believers. It wasn't just promised to that 120 people. Those promises are for all of God's people, for all of his children. We've all been called into that, into that place. And so those promises that were given to them are the same promises that are given to us. Now, the thing with this is, you know, and, the, and that, that whole thing, it's just what it says here. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that outpouring of the, of the Spirit is for, to empower us to, to do this thing, to, to live up to that goal, to live up to that standard, to actually what it says here, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. So God called us to a godly life. He called us to this, and, and, and we know this, and he's called us by his divine power, by his own glory and goodness, and through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So I want to talk a little bit further about this divine nature, um, and I shared a little bit about this last night. I'm just tr- pushing House of His Presence every chance I get, so... <laughs> You'd have a little bit more little things here every time you come. Uh, but we were talking about this a little bit last night and the divine nature. And so it says his divine power has given us everything we need for the godly life, right? Um, and that godly life is participating in the divine nature. Now, he's talking about those promises. We have been given a promise... But then there's also, the promise is to enable us to participate in the divine nature. So the divine nature, when we become a Christian, when you, when you ask Jesus to be your Lord, you know, when you ask him to, to save you, to forgive you, to come and live uh, in you, to become the temple of the Holy Spirit, when all that stuff happens, uh, then we are given a new nature. So we're born with the sinful nature, the fallen nature, you know, you can read all about that in the book of Romans. If you really don't know much about that, uh, maybe sometime we'll talk about it, but we've talked about it in the past. But in the book of Romans, it talks all about the first Adam, the last Adam, all that stuff, how through Adam, Adam fell, and we, you know, and that's in Genesis as well and throughout the Bible. But, you know, the fallen nature, and so we're all born. We're all born unrighteous. We're all fallen short of the glory of God. But it says here that God calls us by his glory and if you read the rest of that verse, Arise, shine, for your light has come. It says his glory has risen upon you. And, and, and Pastor Dale has talked a lot about that whole aspect of glory. But we, we become a new creation in Christ. We were given this divine nature. But the divine nature isn't just a promise that we have, that we claim. And this is the, this is the one thing that happens, uh, that, I, that I see happen a lot, is people claim a promise, right? And we teach that. We've thought, we've taught about that. We've talked about that a lot. Absolutely. If God gives you a promise, claim it. You know, what, and we talked about inherited promises and how as children of God, every promise that is in this book is given for each and every one of us. It's given for his people, for his children. So we have to claim those promises, but, but claiming the promise 
and participating in the divine nature are two different things. And so I talked about this last night, but uh, when I was a kid, um, so I was, I mean, I'm not tall now, but as a kid, I was really small. I was the short, shortest kid in my school, um, and I was, I'll tell you how short I was, okay? So until I was like, I grew like a foot in one summer. It, I was, and then I stopped growing uh, completely. So I was, until I was like 14, I was four foot, four inches. I remember that clearly. I wore the same clothes, you know, the same size of clothes for many, many years. Uh, so I was four feet, four inches. I weighed, you know, about 75 pounds. I was like a tiny little kid. Uh, and, uh, and so when I was in grade two, I was maybe about three feet tall, right? So I don't know, like, Micah's probably bigger than that at this point. Uh, but I was like three feet tall, and I had asthma, and I was not an athlete uh, at anything. But everybody, you know, participates. And not that I didn't like to. I mean, I'd go play, with, like, play basketball with my brothers, and like, they're all like huge. And they'd, they, they would play with the big ball, and I'd play with those little tiny basketballs that are like this big because that's all I could get my hands around and that's all I could shoot high enough and they'd lift me up to dunk the ball and stuff. They'd let me, they'd let me play with them. Wow. They'd let me play with them. Uh, you know, I had three older brothers and so they'd let me play with them and stuff and, and uh, they'd give me, you know, positions to play in whatever sport we were playing where I didn't have to do much, you know, because... Uh, I remember one time I was, playing, I was playing Little League, and I was at, around this age, maybe a little bit older than that, but, uh, and, and we had a guy on our team who had, like, only a thumb and pinky on each hand, and he, I think he had uh, only, like, a big toe or something like that, so he had these braces, but he was, like, one of the best players on our team, and this kid hit home runs, like, all the time, and I was on first base, and he hit the ball, and I couldn't run fast enough. So he, like, picked me up and ran the bases with me. <laughs> um, but it was, it was kind of funny. But anyway, so when I was in, like, grade two, I, uh, I was this small little kid, right? And somehow, I was saying, I don't really know how it happened. I, I really don't understand it to this day. But out of my school and in whatever my division, I guess, it would have been, I won standing long jump. I was, like, this tall. And I won standing long jump. And I was brought to city, the citywide competition for standing long jump, right? And, uh, and clearly, I did not win once I got to the city finals. I mean, I remember it was a great day, right? Because, uh, you know, I didn't have to go to school that day. I got to go to the city final thing. And I remember the day quite clearly, you know. Uh, I remember, like, my cousin was there because he was actually a good athlete. Same age as me, but, like, much bigger and a good athlete. Uh, and... Uh, and so I got to city finals, and, uh, and, and so within all of this, my brothers at the same school, we all went to the same school, I went to the same school that my dad went to when he was a kid. Uh, so it's, I'm pretty sure some of the teachers might have even been the same ones that he had, which could account for some things. Uh, but, but we went to the same school, right? And so my brothers, they were all really athletic, um, you know, bigger guys, tall guys. They were good at hockey. They were good at baseball. They were good at basketball, all this stuff. And so every year, and our, our, our school, that school only went up to grade six, right? So then you went to another school for like seven through 12. Um, and so in grade six, Everybody, and I mean, how big can you be in grade six, really? Although my brother was a huge guy. So you can be pretty big, I guess. But, uh, but so there's this big, huge trophy about that big, all right? And we have pictures. Every one of my brothers, and one person gets that every year. Only one person in the school gets that in grade six. In grade... Oh. Let's see. There we go. In grade six, one person gets that. Uh, and it's like the athlete of the year for the whole school, basically. And it's kind of based on what your like gym scores have, gym uh, grades have been throughout, and uh, and and participation, and how good you did, it and all that stuff. So every one of my brothers won that won that trophy when they graduated from grade six. And you get to like you know they get your like name engraved on it, and everybody gets to take it home for like a week, you know. Uh, 
when you win. So my brothers all won that. I, I did not win that. All right, I did not win that, even though I had an outstanding standing long jump that one day of my life, apparently. Uh, so I didn't win that. But what I did have, and I was going to bring this this morning. So my mom had these, like, blankets that we had, had made for each one of us. And on it are sewed, like, all the awards that we got, like, as kids and stuff. And, like, she, she cut up, like, I did Pioneer Clubs. If anybody knows Pioneer Clubs. When I was a kid, I did Pioneer Club, and you had, like, a little vest that you wore. You know, it was at, it was at the, the church that I went to, and you had a little vest, and you got, like, little badges that were sewn on. Here. It was kind of like the Christian version of Cub Scouts, I guess. Uh, but your, like, awards were generally, I mean, there was some stuff like, you know, I guess crafts and stuff, but a lot of it had to do with, like, memorizing Bible verses and stuff like that, you know, which is a good thing. Uh, so I had that. So on this, like, I've got this horse blanket that has, uh, uh, it's got all these things. So it's got, like, my vest on there, and it's got all the words that I got at school kind of thing. And, uh, and she did one for each one of us. So some of us were in school longer, so they have more things on theirs. But uh, there's not really any gym awards on mine. There's not any ribbons for, you know, athletics on there, really. But what there is in some of those places is a participation ribbon. Who's ever gotten a participation ribbon? <laughs> yes. Participation ribbons. For those who participated but didn't necessarily win <laughs> makes us feel a little bit better that we all... And, you know, I have other things that I did excel in, so that's fine. Um, but, uh, but Jim was never one of those, but it's one of those things that I participated in no matter what. I always, and I, so I've got these ribbons, these little, I'm pretty sure they're purple, participation ribbons. And, you know, they're purple with little gold writing and, you know, and it says participant on it. <laughs> so fun. But here's the thing. In this verse here, Peter says to us, He's given us these precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. And so a lot of people, what they want to do, and I've probably been guilty of this in my own life as well at times, is they want to claim a promise, right? And, and, this, and, and because of this, actually this whole thing has really gotten a bad name, and there's different um, pastors who, you know, I, on, out of certain things, if you go on Facebook, I don't recommend it, but if you were to go on Facebook and look up certain pastors, you'd, hear, you'd see a lot of actual, what I would consider hateful talk, malicious talk against them on the internet, um, because they encourage people to claim the promises of God, even. And the problem is not the claiming of those promises. The problem is that people claim them, but then don't participate in the divine nature. So they say stuff like, God, I'm going to claim my health right now. And I've got, and see, this is why I say that I can be, you know, I can be guilty of this myself. Because, not that I really do that that much, because I'm generally pretty healthy, but I claim my health. But if I say to God, you know, God, I claim fitness, I claim your health and a whole body, and I have a gym membership that I've been paying for the past six months that I haven't gone to the gym and used, I can claim that all I want, but that's not going to give me that body. That's not going to give me that health that I need. I can say that I claim financial prosperity. I can say I, f I claim... Uh, financial health, even. You know, we talk, we read in, this, in, the, in the Bible promises that God will bless us, that God wants to prosper his people, that, you know, all these sort of things. But I can claim that while still going out and getting credit card after credit card and buying things that I don't have the money for and say, I'll, pay, I'll, I'll get it now and I'll pay for it later. You know, there's entire stores uh, which, and not to go uh, down any rabbit trails, but, you know, there's these stores, these rent-to-own stores that are out there, and they, they, they try to make it like they're there for your good. I just want you to be able to have that flat-screen TV today, and you'll pay the same amount for the next two years, 
which ends up actually, if you work it out, between the interest and fees and all that stuff, being probably two to three times what you would have paid if you had to just put that money in a bank account for six months, and you'd own it right out, you know? So how can we, we, we can't say, God, I claim financial health, but then, and I claim prosperity, but I'm not going to get a job, and I'm not going to save money, I'm just going to live on on credit, and I'm just going to just keep adding to this mountain of debt. We have a responsibility to actually step out into this place where we practice godly financial principles, where we actually uh, practice, you know, we ask God to, you know, heal my back, but my back is sore because I'm carrying 20 or 30 extra pounds, and you know, I can say this to myself because I had a bad back, and it wasn't really because I was caring because I'm really not that big, but it was due to other things. But I can say, hey, God, you know, can you help me to breathe better so that I can, you know, but I never run. You know, I, I, never, I never work towards that. I never actually, you know, go and run and work on my cardiovascular health. I can't actually ask God to, to help make me a, win a marathon when I've never run a day in my life. It's just not going to happen, you know, and, and this goes all through all these things. And so people, you know, people go and we go to these places. And I, I fully believe in claiming, I fully believe in impartation. We pray for people, we pray for impartation for people, but then there's the other side of it. And, and, and if you read stuff by like guys like Sean Boltz, who we all look at Sean Boltz and, you know, if you don't know who he is, uh, go look him up. He's pretty, quite amazing, the words that he gets from God. He will get people's names, phone numbers, addresses, the names of their kids, you know, the place where they work, and then stuff that God wants to say to them. And he writes it down. And, and like he says, I'm not always right. But he's, you know, he says, and then God gives him messages for people in such incredible ways. I mean, I, I heard one story, I think, I think it was at Bethel's prophetic conference or something last year, the year before, and God woke him up in the middle of the night, and he just started writing all this stuff out. And he had no idea. To him, it looked like gibberish. And then he brings it to somebody, and they bring it to a translator. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is Afrikaans. You wrote out all these people's names in Afrikaans and, and stuff for them, right? And so he starts calling out these, and these people are there at the conference. You know, I, 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 was, I saw another one where he was in Asia or something, and he started writing all these things down, didn't know what they were, and he, and he brought them to the guy, and they were written in the language of the country he was in. I can't remember what, where it was, Korea or something like that. And it was the names of every single person that was registered for the conference that day. And then he had messages. He had, like, words from God for these people, prophetic words. But he says, if you read his stuff, he says, you know, you got to practice that gift. God gives the gift, but you actually have to practice that. And so if I go and I say, hey, God, I want, you know, I want words of knowledge for people, or I want to be able to prophesy over people, or if I want to be able to heal, uh, you know, pray for healing and see people healed, but we don't actually ever pray for somebody to be healed. We don't actually ever, ever go and pray and say, you know, because like some people hear from God in like crazy ways, like right now, right here. But even Sean Bolt says, like, he goes ahead of time and he prays and he spends time with God asking God, what do you have for me for this thing? And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes he gets it wrong. Sometimes he's like, oh, it's just me. You know, but he says, as you practice that gift, as you participate in that divine nature, you actually begin to mature in it. And I talked about this a little bit. When we look at revival, when we talk about this, we don't just want a, a renewal that, will, that gives us signs and wonders and stuff for right now, but in six months, it fizzles out, and then the, we're, we're just the same as we were six months ago before it ever happened. But we want to be moving to a place of maturity where revival gets passed on f from generation to generation, that, that this church that this body and that this city will be transformed and that will keep going further and further and going to a place of maturity in, in, that, that will not end, essentially. That's what we're looking for. Until Jesus comes back, we want this move to keep going, keep going, keep going, passed on from generation to generation to generation. And so in this, we need to actually participate in the divine nature. So that divine nature is just what it says. It's, it's the divine nature, that, that nature of God, that empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we've been given as a new creation in Christ. 
And he says, he's given us these promises, so we have these promises, we have to, you know, claim them, but we also have to actually put feet to that. We have to put action to that and actually walk these things out and actually participate. You don't get the participation ribbon if you, you know, don't go and participate. If you're, like, sitting in the stands, I mean, those days, my parents came to the thing, and they watched me, you know, jump, but they didn't get a they didn't get a participation ribbon like I did. I got it because I participated and was awesome. So, going on to this, when it comes to our faith, we've been given this divine nature. We're supposed to participate in it. We're supposed to walk this out. And we're supposed to, the goal, once again, the goal is to never fall. That means the goal is maturity Throughout this, this, you know, Peter and Paul's writings, they talk about becoming mature believers. And so this is what it comes to. If we want to actually participate in these things, we have to actually uh, do this. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance, perseverance, godliness and to godliness, mutual affection, mutual affection and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and productive. So we're supposed to be possessing these things in increasing measure, which means we are constantly growing. We're constantly coming to new places of maturity. We're constantly participating more and more in that divine nature so that we we can grow and become who God's called us to be. We need to participate in that divine nature and we need to grow in measure. Because this is the thing. Here's, here's, the, here's the thing that it comes to. When we, when we look at even the revivals that, that we've been a part of, I mean, I've, I've seen a bunch of stuff as I was growing up. Um, went to Toronto a lot when I was a kid with all that. Um, the, the Toronto blessing and everything that was going on there. And, and there was things that were happening in my city that I was in, Sudbury. And there was, you know, there's been stuff happening all over the place. And there's stuff happening now. And, and with what God's doing here now, we can get so mesmerized even by a gifting, by a manifestation of God's presence that we actually just go after that manifestation and don't actually go after God. And we don't actually go after the maturity and the maturing of our faith. And we don't go after participation in that divine thing. And we're, we're basically good to sit back and watch and come to church every week and, you know, receive. And, and, and we put ourselves into this sort of thing like we're at the theater watching a movie, you know. And, and we, you know, we get our little dispensation of popcorn, you know. And we get to sit there and, you know, somebody prays over us and we receive God's love. And we receive his joy. And we sit there, but we never actually move into the place where we are actually participating. And we are uh, being the one that God is using to give his love away, to give his joy away, to bring other people into his kingdom, to bring other people to that place of reconciliation, of freedom in Christ. And so we need to add to this thing. And so there's, and you know, we, we prayed in that prayer, in that uh, little declaration, we talked about anointings, gifts, and callings. And, and, and those are different parts of this whole thing. And when we look at gifts, there's a difference between gifts and there's a difference between a calling, there's a difference between anointing, there's a gift, a difference between uh, God's gift to us, there's a difference between his, um, uh, between character, there's a difference between fruit of the Spirit, right? So we talked about bearing fruit, all right? We talked about bearing fruit a little bit. I read that verse about be abiding him and bearing fruit. Um, and it says in here, they were supposed to be. Where is it? I was just reading it. Anyways, we're supposed to bear fruit. So, giftings and manifestations, you know, we talk about the gifts of prophecy. If you look in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, it talks about the gifts, and it talks about how God gives different gifts to different people. And, uh, and so the giftings, we've got the gifts of prophecy, the gift of healing, we've got the, you know, the gifts of the word of knowledge, we've got these different things, we've got the offices of, you know, the, the God calls people to be um, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, um, 
and pastors. Um, and so these are different areas. And so who knows the difference between the, the, the actual gift of goodness, the character of goodness, and the fruit of goodness? Do you ever think that those are actually, those are, actually, I'm going to turn this thing off. And I'll... The gift, the character, those are different things. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Now, in this passage... It talks about self-control being something that we need to add to our faith. However, fruit is something, is not something that we make happen ourselves. It's not a, you know, it's not just something that we make happen. It's, It's actually a fruit of the Spirit. But how do we add it? Because it's also a character trait. So we're talking about this. So we're going to just look at a few of these this morning. Uh, And next week we're going to talk a little bit more about this, this thing of, uh, because I can't, I can't cover everything, like, you know, I really probably could do, like, 10 weeks on this, and I've got three weeks, so, uh, <laughs> so we're going to look, and I'm going to do a pretty paraphrased look at these, but, but the, bo- the point is we need to add to our faith. It's not enough to just claim a promise. It's not enough just to, uh, to, to go to church. It's not enough just to do these, but it's not enough just to be saved, but we actually have to add to our faith, that we have to have that goal and we have been, and it says here, we've been given everything we need to participate in the divine nature. We've given everything we need to grow in our faith. We've been given everything we need. We've been given grace and peace so that we can actually move into those places and we can actually live up to that goal. And so we have this goal of being, of never falling, of, of being holy as he is holy. And in order to do that, we need to add to our faith. You know, we talked about perseverance, and I'm going to talk about that, mm, I think, next week. But per- perseverance means that you continue to actually go forward. It means that you continue to add to your faith. So, for this very reason, make every effort, every effort. I mean, I looked all these words up in the Greek. I, like, looked word for word everything because, like, oh, does it mean something different? Because, you know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, it's an English word. It was originally Greek. What does it look like? So I looked them all up, and almost every one of them actually means what it says. So when it says make every effort, that means make every effort. You got to do something. You got to do everything you can to add to your faith. So add to your faith goodness. So let's look at goodness. So goodness here, who knows what goodness means? Does anybody know what goodness means? I mean, we kind of probably all have like a little general idea, but does anybody know what goodness means without looking it up on Google really quick? Goodness, well, there's a couple things that it means, but it literally means good. Goodness, you know, exactly what you think it means, being good. But goodness means, has another meaning in there, that means moral excellence, virtue, and behavior showing high moral standards. So goodness, we can think of goodness and we can say, oh, you know, I'm a good person. I do good things, you know. But what does that mean, you know, because we also say, oh, you know, we had pizza the other day and it was good, you know. I ate a, a good meal the other day. And then we also use the word good for a lot of other things, like, I was a good boy. Can I have a piece of pizza now? Um, so I looked up a few, a few verses that talk about God's goodness, but talk about what goodness means in the Bible. So Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 27, 13, and I'm just going to rattle these off really quick. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Psalm 147, 5 verse 7. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on what he has made. All right, and see, here's sort of where it looks. These other ones, they're talking kind of about God's provision. 
They're talking about God's goodness in our lives. They're talking about how he is good to us. But then it sort of shifts to this other side that talks about righteousness, that talks about uh, moral excellence, that talks about virtue, that talks about behavior showing high moral standards. It says, the Lord is good to all. He is just. He has compassion on all he has made. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, Proverbs 2, verse 9. And if you look this up, there's a lot. There's like 600 times in the Bible, 600 verses that talk about this. Proverbs 2, 20. You will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. Proverbs 3, verse 4. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Proverbs eleven twenty seven: Whoever seeks good finds favor, but evil comes to the one who searches for it. Proverbs twelve fourteen: From the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things, and the work of their hands bring them reward. Proverbs thirteen two: From the fruit of the lips, people enjoy good things, but the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. What we talk about, what we say, actually can be good or bad, and will actually influence the way that we live our lives and the way that, th- that our lives work out. Proverbs 13, verse 15, good judgment wins favor, but the way of the faithful, unfaithful leads to their destruction. Proverbs 13, 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's ch- children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Proverbs 14, 19, I'm almost done, evildoers will bow down in the presence of the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. I got two pages left, apparently, of goodness, so I'm not going to read them all. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything, doing anything good. In everything, set them an example by what is doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity. This is a trustworthy saying, and I may want you to stress these things to those, to that, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. A lot of people live their lives saying, my, effect, my, my actions just affect me. It doesn't matter what I do. It's my choice to do what I want, and, and we can just, I can just do whatever I want. This, this whole thing of grace that I was talking about, grace doesn't mean I just keep going and doing whatever I want because God's going to forgive me. It means that I actually live up to this standard, and my behavior changes. This word that we just read in Ephesians says that we're God's handiwork created to, in Christ Jesus to do good works, you know, James says, faith without works is dead. So if we claim these promises and we don't actually participate, goodness means that we do the good works that God prepared for us, that we actually participate in the divine nature, that we actually do those good things, that we do what is righteous, what is just, that we live up to this place of where we, where we, div- we participate in the divine nature and we do what is righteous and what is just and what is holy, that we live in a place of, of, of moral excellence, that we live in a place... Uh, that, uh, where we have our behavior showing good standards, where we don't just do what we want and we post what we want on Facebook and we say what we want to anybody because I can, because I've got grace. That's not the way it works. Adding to our faith means we add goodness, means that we treat people with the goodness of God, which means that we do what is right which means we have a high moral standard, which means we actually shoot for that goal of never falling. And like I said last week, it's not about being religious uh, and legalistic and, and just doing the right thing for the sake of the right thing, but if God is in us, we should be coming more like Him, which means our behavior should change. I don't do all the same stuff that I did when I was like 17. I've actually grown past a lot of that stuff, and I don't do those things anymore. I don't think the same way. I don't live the same way because I've grown into a place. I've added some goodness to my faith, and I know that I still got a lot more goodness to add. So it's not about, you know, obeying all the rules, doing the right thing, and then God loves you. 
God loves you regardless of whether you do the right thing or the wrong thing. He forgives you regardless, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a, a, this place of repentance that we come to, which means we change the way we think, and we change the way we act, and we become more like him, and we add to our faith. So God says we need to add goodness, which means that we add his goodness into our lives. That means that our behavior should change. That means the way that we think about things need to be a godly mindset and not a worldly mindset. Because the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, right? But, it's, but God's ways and God's thoughts are so much higher than ours. He's got a different perspective, and we need to learn his perspective. And that brings us to the second one that we're going to add. We're going to add some knowledge. We're going to add some knowledge. Oh, here's another thing. I'll just, I just add this one on there. Matthew seven seventeen. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, if a good tree bears good fruit, then we need to look at the fruit we're bearing and see if it's good. And if it's not, we need to add some goodness to our faith so that our behavior changes, so that our life changes, so we begin to actually bear the good fruit of Jesus. And that comes not from doing, but it comes from, you know, I mean, it does come from doing, right? Because it's this whole thing, like, you know, I, you know, we are in Christ, but he's created us to do good works, right? He's created us to do things, not to just you know, that whole abiding is to give us the empowerment, the divine empowerment to participate in the divine nature so that we can actually do what he's called us to do. So, in order to do what he's called us to do, in order to add goodness, in order to add any of this stuff to our faith, one of the things that we have to add to our faith is knowledge. And you know what that Greek word for knowledge means? Knowledge. I heard you say it means knowledge, but it means more than that. It means knowledge, and it means comprehension, all right? So there's a difference between being able to recite a fact, and there's a difference between actually comprehending that. I, I you know, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but some people who, you know, uh, it's kind of funny, but if you go to a different country, uh, or people, you know, if you live here and there's people from other countries, which there's a ton of people from other countries in Canada, sometimes you ask them a question in English, and they're like, yes, 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 and they have no idea what you just said to them. And I, we, we, I I'm probably have said that in Spanish, in some Spanish countries that I've been to, so I'm just as guilty of it. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, see, sí, see. Sí. Oh, yeah but adding knowledge and comprehension, right? So I used to do this, you know, we probably all have done it, but reading and comprehension. I can read this book all day long. You ever, anybody ever done speed reading? Training in speed reading? Yeah. It's, you know, it's basically, and I used to do this because I didn't want to do schoolwork, right? Now, I like to read, and so when it would come to, like, novels and stuff, I'd love to read. I'd read novels all day long, you know, westerns, and, like, there's this guy named Jim Kelgard who wrote all these awesome books. I don't know if you ever read any of his stuff, but he wrote these songs, like, called, like, Big Red, uh, about this, like, Irish setter, and this kid has this hunting dog and stuff, and so I loved it, you know, and so I'd read all of his books when I was a kid. I loved them, and I'd read them over and over again, and so I could read those, you know, and I can read through them really fast, right, because they're exciting stories, but then it would come to stuff like learn the English language, you know, and they would be verbs and adverbs and prepositional phrases and all that junk, which some people probably, if you have an English degree, would say it's not junk. It probably is important to know, but I didn't like to read that stuff, so I would do speed reading, and I would, and I would do, I did some courses in speed reading so that you could read really fast, which actually is not great because speed reading does not help that much with comprehension. It gives you some pretty quick short-term memory boost, but you don't really retain that. You don't really comprehend what you're saying. I can read through, I mean, I could read through this book. You know, I could read through Second Peter probably within a couple of minutes, 
and I might be able to, for about five or ten minutes, point out a few things that it says. But an hour later, I probably don't really remember what that what that said. So I could so I I would do that. And some people who like learn to speed read really well, like they actually learn comprehension too. And I, that's way beyond me because I think that's actually like a skill that you learn. But comprehension is the thing. We can we can read this book over and over again. We can recite verses from this book, the Word of God, but never actually understand. And comprehend what God is saying to us. Never actually get that revelation of what he's saying and how we should change. And this is, this is really kind of an epidemic in our world. And uh, you know that one song that we wrote or that we listened? We didn't write it. I wish I wrote it. Uh, that we, uh, we sang that first song this morning. Um, heart runs. My heart runs after you. So that's John Mark McMillan. If anybody... If, if you know him or not, uh, John Mark McMillan is this awesome guy from, like, North Carolina, and he wrote that song, and he wrote the song, How He Loves, you know, Oh, How He Loves Us, he wrote that one, and a few other songs that we've sung here, but he wrote this song, and, and, and I love his music, because, you know, I, I really don't like poetry, that was one of those things that I would speed read, just, you know, I, I wanted to like it, I really wanted to like it, but... It's just, I go, and, I, and so I'll even pick up books now. I'll be like, you know, I should be more cultured. If I'm going to write music, I need to be able to be more poetic. And then I get, like, like into one verse, and I'm like, oh, no, this is just not me. I can't do it. Uh, but, but John Mark McMillan, he is a poet uh, in this way. And, and, and I love about his music because it's so different than so much of other music that we put in Christian circles. And he says stuff in his songs that is kind of sometimes grating against church culture and grating against what is sort of accepted, you know. I remember when it first came out, now we sing it like this sometimes and sometimes we don't, depending. But I remember when he first wrote... Uh, uh, how he loves, and in the in the second verse, he says, "Sloppy wet kiss," and he's talking about God loving us, and he says, "It's like a sloppy wet kiss," and everybody's like, "Oh, you can't sing sloppy wet kiss in church. You have to sing unforeseen kiss." So they have alternate lyrics for those who can't handle a sloppy wet kiss, you know. And and but I love that he does that. When you listen to his music, he he has this stuff, and so he's got this song, Borderlands. And I just love the way that he puts stuff in his songs. In his song, Borderlands, he says, you know, he says, I'm living in the borderland. Uh, I don't feel like a boy. I don't feel like a man. He's like, I don't know where I belong right now. But he says this one line, and he says, I've got Bibles bent like shivs. All right? Now, a shiv is obviously a prison weapon used to hurt somebody. In, an, in a hidden manner, made out of something that it was not intended to be. And, I, and, and that, that line, that's how so many people use the Bible. They have Bibles that are bent like shivs that are used to, instead of exhort people, instead of to edify people, instead of to actually love and bring people to a place of correction, they use it to knife people in the back. They use it to, to just cut people down, to cut the... Cut, all over them. And so when we're looking at the Bible, if we, if we you know, it's very easy. Like, you ever heard the, 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 the saying, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing? You know? And, and, and we can look all through, through history and we can see places where they had a little bit of knowledge. You know, I mean, look at, look at early medicine. For example, you know, early medicine, you know, they would bleed people out, you know? Some of that was quite was the right knowledge. There was a problem there, but you know they do stuff like bleed them out or take out bile or make them drink bile or do different weird things like that because they thought that there was these four things. I can't remember what they are, but like blood bile and I don't know a few different things that they thought if if there's an improper balance in any one of these things, it's what causes sickness in the body, right? So they do these weird weird things uh, under the name of science because they had a little bit of knowledge. But a lot of people bled out and died because 
they said, well, we got to get the bad blood out of them, but then they didn't have, like, good blood to put back in and stuff like that, right? They just thought there was an imbalance in the blood, not that the person actually needed all this blood in their body, you know? So they weren't actually replacing it with anything. They were just saying, oh, they got too much blood, so they'll take a bunch of blood out, and they'd take too much out, and they'd, they'd die, right? Because they had a little bit of knowledge. Truly, there was a problem with their blood, but instead of actually doing the right thing. So a little bit of knowledge can be very dangerous. And, I mean, this happens. I mean, you can see this all through, you know? I mean when they started radiate, like, you know, like using x-rays and stuff, they didn't know what all it did. They didn't realize what all this radiation was doing, you know? And so, you know, they, they do weird things like, let's watch these people, you know, eating under an x-ray because it's cool. We can see what happens with the food as they swallow it and stuff like that. We can see what's happening in their body because, but then all these people got radiation poisoning <laughs> because they, they had the right idea. We still use x-rays, but they didn't have the comprehension of everything that that means. They didn't have the revelation of everything that means and what that means when you do those things, right? So when it comes to knowledge, we have to actually add knowledge and understanding to our faith so that we're not immature, so that we're not bending this Bible up into a shiv and knifing somebody in the back with it, so that we're actually using it for what it was intended for. And when we grow in knowledge, let's hear, let's just, and I'm, I'm almost done here. I'm trying to stay close by on our time. But uh, knowledge, okay, let's look at just a few. I don't have nearly as many verses. Not that there's not as many, but I was trying to, like, cut them down a bit. Um, day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Psalm 119.66, teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Proverbs 1, seven: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom in, will enter your heart and knowledge will be a pleasant to your soul. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? And that's what I was talking about. This is zeal. You know, we're talking about Peter's zeal. You know, he had zeal, but he didn't have the knowledge to go with that. And so when, when he did that, he you know, cut off a guy's ear because he had zeal for Jesus, but he didn't know the plan. He didn't have the knowledge of what the plan was. And so Jesus, you know, picked the guy's ear back up, slapped it back on his head, you know, and then went about the rest of the plan, you know. Jesus, you know, at his transfiguration, Peter didn't know what was going on. So he just starts talking. He's like, let's make tents. You can live there. I'll live there. He'll live there. We'll just stay up here. We'll hang out with each other. It's going to be such a good time. He didn't know what he was saying. That's what the Bible says. He didn't have knowledge of what he was saying even. And so we need to add to our faith goodness. We need to add to our faith knowledge. These are two. And we're going we're gonna to look in the, in the future uh, in the next couple of weeks, about the other things that we need to add to our faith. Godliness, adding self-control, adding perseverance, brotherly love, brotherly kindness and love. What's the difference between those two, you know? What's the difference between brother, brotherly kindness and love? Isn't this the same thing? No, it's not. We need to add those, both those things. What's the difference between goodness and godliness? Because they kind of seem like they're the same thing. These are things that we need to learn, and that's adding to our knowledge, adding to our knowledge of who God is, of what he is like, of what he has in store for us. We need to add to knowledge. Daniel 1.17 says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. Daniel could understand and do the role and, and function in the role that he was put there in Nebuchadnezzar's life because God gave him knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and he was able to, to, to interpret dreams and visions because he had that knowledge. If we have zeal and we don't add to our faith knowledge, we're going to cause some pretty serious problems in people's lives because we're going to hurt people even though we had good intentions because we're zealous, but then we didn't go and add knowledge to that, and we didn't learn how to do it properly all over the world. I mean, you look at, at, at the history of, you know, of, of missions... And people went into missions with a lot of zeal back in the day, but they went in with very little knowledge. And so what happened, instead of actually learning how to minister to people, they colonized them instead. And they said, you don't need to be you and learn how Jesus loves you in your context. You need to become like me, and you need to become westernized. Or else they'd go, I mean, this happened in the, in, in the Pentecostal circles, right? And this is another thing, like, people would say, okay, I've been given this gift of tongues, 
And we know that sometimes, you know, in the Bible we read about it, and, and it's happened, I, I know other people that it's happened for, where the gift of tongues is actually an earthly language, but sometimes it's not an earthly language, it's a spiritual language between us and God. But early on in the Pentecostal uh, movement, back about, you know, a hundred and some years ago, they said, oh, God's, you know, he's calling us to be missionaries. He's given us the gift of tongues. We know Chinese, so we're going to go there. And we don't need to learn Chinese because God's already given it to us. And they showed up in China, and nobody knew what they were saying. And so then they had to come on. And they, that was a long boat ride back then. That was not like jump on, jump on a plane and, you know, 20 hours later you're there or whatever. It, it was like, no, you, go, you went to China on a boat. Took you months to get there. You didn't learn a lick of Chinese. And now you're there, and you can't minister anybody because you're saying, I know Chinese. And they're like, no, you don't. So we need to add knowledge to our zeal so that we actually function. God gives us knowledge. Solomon prays for knowledge and wisdom, and God gave it to him as, long, as well as riches, honor, everything else that he needed, right? So we need, to, we need to add to our knowledge, and that actually requires work. That means reading this book. That means studying the Bible. It means not just reading a verse, but actually, you know, like I said, like I looked all the words up in Greek to see what they mean. I look them up in the dictionary to see what do those words mean. I look up what other people say about this concept and whatever, you know, that's what it takes to actually, and that's not just for pastors to do. That's for everybody to do. I did, my mom did that, like taught us to do that when I was a little kid. When I was like 10 years old, I was using Strong's Concordance, and that is like this book that I have in my office. It's like this You know, and it's got every, it's got all the Greek and Hebrew words broken down with their meanings, where else they're found in the Bible, where all these things live. You know, I was doing that when I was like 10 years old. And, and so, if you haven't, honestly, that's probably one of the best things. You don't need to actually learn Greek, you know. I mean, you can, you can because it's actually, but they give you like the English version of it as well, like the phonetically how to say it and stuff in, in Canadian in English, <laughs> uh, they, they, they give you that, and so you can learn how to do that. So there's tools that we have to, to increase in our knowledge, and, and God gives us knowledge. He gives us wisdom. He gives us revelation, but we actually have to add to that. We have to actually practice that. We actually have to study our Bibles. We actually have to learn these things, and, and we have to be, and, and can I say all of this needs to be done in community with other believers, with, uh, with with coverings, with spiritual coverings, so that we're not just out on our own doing those doing this thing on our on our own without any accountability. We need to be accountable to people in our life, so that we're not just running off and saying stuff and and doing stuff without any covering, without any accountability to anyone, because that is just as dangerous as trying to do this stuff. With, without any knowledge, without any, without any of these things added to our faith. You know, we need to actually, you know, we have to have that zeal, but that fire and that zeal has to be paired with community. God created the church. He said, don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. He said, be a part of the church. He says, you need to meet together. You know, that's one of the big reasons of the church, why we come on a Sunday together is to worship God. It, it, it's, it's to be filled up. It's to actually be in fellowship with each other and be accountable each other, to each other. Uh, not so that, you know, we can get each other in trouble. That's not what I mean by accountability. Accountability means that, that we have grace for each other and that we actually come, come into each other's places of knowledge. And like, I have people that I'm accountable to. Pastor Dale has people that he's accountable to. I mean, Bill Johnson has people that he's accountable to. I mean, Billy Graham had people that he was accountable to. And it wasn't like to make sure you don't sin. That's not what accountability is about. It's not about making sure you don't sin. It's about actually having the grace to be pushed forward and to be lifted higher and to be coming to new places of godliness and to, divine, to, to new places of participating in this divine nature. So we're just going to pray now, okay? I'm going to stop right there because I could probably go on for a bit more. But, there, but come back.